difficulty in the trial is that both of these might be all beneficial for them. I think all difficulties are good. <coughs> if you have the tools to first look at them, to see their impact, both on physical and then emotional, and maybe some intellectual reflective stages, and if you happen to have a soul, maybe spiritual, and then figure out what you want to do with them. If you want to take personal action, social action, political action, but in the absence of having tools, you know, there, it's one thing if you and I are in a relationship and we get into a disagreement and we've been around the block a few times where you and I can sit and have a conversation, like two adults. If on the other hand, we've never been there in the space where we can sit and talk and it's a new experience for us, every disagreement is an inch closer to the downfall of our relationship. So yeah, I mean, I think it's great that, I mean, without difficulties, you can't grow. But if you don't have the tools to figure out the difficulties and how to remedy them, then whatever childish habits you may have, they'll become more infantile as time goes on. You know, there are <clears throat> two aspects of life that I think it's worthy to consider. There is the A, and then there is the B. The A is the horizontal. It's a place where you're born and you live in society, your parents, whatever you know, environment you may be in. It imposes upon you some forces. Those forces shape you, give you identity, meaning, purpose, and all of that. Then you get old, then you get sick, then you die. There isn't much you need to do here. You know, society is more than happy to turn you into a robot and do with you what it wills. You know, and whatever emotional, intellectual, spiritual resources or powers you have, you use them to fix all the dilemmas here. You read books, you take classes, you watch YouTube, all that stuff. But you have signposts here. You don't need to go very far. You know, even if you have emotional issues, it's like, uh, you know, there's a safe way for that. You do therapy. If you have a spiritual crisis, well, there is religion, all that stuff. So most of the things down here that happen to you are, <clears throat> for the most part, organic. There isn't much you need to do. Sure, you'll suffer, you'll fall, you hurt yourself, bleed, and you'll die a miserable death. And your life is profoundly meaningless, but nevertheless, you'll try to survive. And you don't need to make much effort. There is this line, which is the vertical line. <clears throat> to travel this path, you have to leave this behind, which means all the cultural data, information, experience, your parents, your friends, most of it, should you desire to go this path, and you can call this your intellectual evolution, your emotional evolution, your spiritual evolution. It doesn't matter what you name you want to call it. <clears throat> This requires a great amount of awareness, then mindfulness, then figuring out what tools you need to kind of bring these two things to life, you know. Um, you know, one of the, I think, most interesting examples that come from real life uh, that I like to use is Mike Tyson and James Baldwin. If you were to call Mike Tyson the N-word, he'll probably just beat you up to death. He just reacts. There is nothing wrong with it. Uh, <clears throat> you shouldn't have called him the N-word, but you have. And he just explodes. Okay. James Baldwin has a different reaction. He kind of looks at you and says, I wonder if you're sick. I mean, I have a name, my name is James. I have a history. Just call me by my name, you don't need to use the N-word, you know. And just in case, in case you can't, well, let's go to Pete's Coffee, let's sit, let's have a conversation. Let me figure out what your diseases are. Now, for you to become a James Baldwin, you have to go on this path. 
because you have to refrain and restrain yourself from exploding, from reacting. You need to sit back and look at the human being and not react to them, except to say that there is something wrong with them. I want to figure out what is wrong with them, possibly come up with some tools to heal them. That's something that needs a lot of work, which means you have to kind of become emotionally detached. You have to intellectually not react, you know, and um, <clears throat> yeah, so there you have it. And given the fact that we are creatures of sloth, laziness, and because in the horizontal life, uh, there are lots of things that we lust and greed after, it doesn't leave much room for the vertical life. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if somebody were to take the vertical path, would there be any reason or possibility to kind of return to the horizontal path? I mean, af like after you've taken the vertical path. It depends on your temperament. Uh, it's a great question. As a Complicated, at least for me, answer. And I'm not really in the mood. You know, it's like you want to go home and have a good time with your wife, and she looks at you and says, I'm not really in the mood, so get away from me, don't touch me. So, okay. So this question is <laughs> very much like that. I'm not in the mood. Uh, but I will be in like a couple minutes. Yeah, hey, Wolf. Food, connecting families together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Part of it is cultural. Uh, it could be part of your cultural heritage, like historical culture. Part of it has to be, ha can be with your family because you, each family has its own culture. If you have been born or raised in a family where you've always had an open door policy, anyone who knocks you, friend or foe, you know, strangers, you say, please come in. Uh, you know, here, when I knock on my neighbor's door once in a while, there are old people, like 150, just to see if they're alive. Uh, I always pray that they're dead so I can go in and steal a few things. <clears throat> but they open, they say, yes, what do, you, what do you want? And the door is just cracked, you know. I say, you know, I've known you for like 15 years. Can you maybe open the door a bit more? No, no, no. Okay. Now, whenever they knock, you know, the door is completely open. Please come in. You know, a few days ago, we were going to uh, go somewhere, and uh, his wife, who's about like 70, she was walking, says, oh, you want to come with us? Where are you guys going? Safeway. Yeah, I'll come with you guys. You know, that's, it's not because you're nice people. It's not because we like you, that's why we give you food. It's just part of our culture. It's something we are burdened to carry. <clears throat> I think if you happen to be part of this culture, and not so much in the South, maybe just in California, uh, again, depending on your orientation, your family, familial culture, you either have an open door policy or a cracked door policy or just closed door policy. And most people have either a very tiny crack or uh, <laughs> a just closed door policy. Uh, one of the worst things that could happen to a monk around the 12th to about 14th century was for the senior disciple or the abbot or the father or the person in charge of the monastery to look at the novice monks or senior monks and tell them, you guys are not having food with us, get out. Now you can pray with us, you can meditate with us, you can read with us, but you can't have food with us. And it goes back to the Last Supper that uh, drinking the wine and um, breaking the bread and eating the bread. Some people argue it wasn't really metaphorical. The wine really had to do with the blood of Christ himself. 
you know, and the bread had to do with his flesh, that you had to actually take a bite of his thigh or something. Um, part of the ritual of the Last Supper is that it's usually headed by the head of your clan or community. <clears throat> and there is something about them that's magnetic, charismatic, you can say spiritual or mature. If you've seen the movie like Water for Chocolate, you know, you don't make food because you resent your guests, you make food because you love them and that passion that lives inside you injects itself into the dish that you're making. And it's a way to bring families together, people together. If you happen to have watched the movie um, Scent of the Woman, you know, it's a Christmas night and I think uh, Al Pacino and his caregiver has walked, they've, they've walked to uh, his brother's house. It's a nice family dinner, but because of their past, because of their history, it all of a sudden it shows its face and becomes very, very divisive. And in fact, it gets into a fist fight. And then Al Pacino looks at the brother and the family and says, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't have come in the first place. So food by itself doesn't really mean anything. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to the Middle East or if you're a Mormon or a Catholic where you have to fast for a number of days. <sighs> I was uh, born and raised in a Muslim environment. And so when you walk the streets, about 30 days in a year, a month in a year, everybody fasts. And because we are tribal people, and uh, tribal people have no choice but to embody a good amount of shame, okay? There is embarrassment, but there is shame that connects you to other people. In other words, if, for example, you come to my house and let's say you're a plumber and you want to fix the, I don't know, the faucet or something, and I'm in the middle of eating my food, I have to put my food away. I can't eat in front of you. And if I do, I have to ask you, would you like some food? Are you hungry? That is what we call a shame culture. And this is, for the most part, has to do with third world countries where you have to share what you have with other people because of the absence of resources. America is not so much a shame culture, but an embarrassed culture. Shame has to do with the fact that there are people you hold above you, you respect them, you fear them, you value their judgments, and you certainly don't want to be demonized by them uh, because then your life would kind of just fall apart. Uh, when you lose shame, it means that you have no one above you, you respect no one. You know, you say someone, F you, for example, and they say, I'm sorry, really embarrassed to have said that. Shame is you just drop the class and you try never to show your face because it's just too much. <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, sometimes when you do have, uh, send out an invitation for food for other people, especially your family, it really for the most part has to do with your cultural background and how shame, how powerful shame, the component of shame is in your culture. Chris. How are you? How are you? Good. <sighs> Food is really good. It's difficult to survive without it. Um. May I be... <sighs> are you sure? You know, I've been teaching for about 30 years, and um, I get repeat students, and after a while I see them in my classes like day after day after day for years. And at the beginning of every semester I usually tell people, you know, the best thing you can do for yourself in my classes is not so much to understand the ideas, it's none of your business, these are my ideas. I just come to class, I use your ears to kind of just see my own reflection. It's not about you, it's about me. But the best you can do in these classes is to find friendships, create friendships, and then, you know, take down each other's numbers, go have coffee, 
uh, once or twice a week, go somewhere and have some food together. And I know that people are busy. I mean, they have no parents. Maybe they're sad, depressed. Maybe it's just not a culture where friendship comes easy. And maybe it's a bias on my part because we are third world people. And when you're poor, you have no need but to be dependent. Good morning, George. You have no choice but to be dependent on other people. You know, uh, it really is like building a house. You just can't do it all by yourself because things are heavy. And oftentimes the events life gives you, imposes upon you, are quite heavy. And you need people. <clears throat> and what I've discovered in the past maybe 30 years is Americans have a very, very difficult time making friendships. You know, I, I don't know if it's because of time factor. I don't know if it's because of their personal history factor. I don't know if it's a cultural factor. Um, especially if you enjoy ideas. And not just these ideas. If you enjoy the art of reflection, which means that you have to stand back, become aware of what's happening to you, then observe the stuff that are happening to you, then try to process them. And after a while you say, it's too much. I need someone to talk to. And, and these are like private experiences. They are deep in emotions. They are intense. They make you solitary. And at times, you know, if you want your body to be touched sometimes by someone because that's what you see your organism demands, I think emotionally, intellectually, these two parts of you, bodies of you demand that, you know, share your emotions with someone, share, share me with someone. And the more mature you become, I think, the more embodied you become, you say, I'm just not going to trash my body. I'm just not going to have it lay with just anyone. And so you go to the people whom you trust, you know, and one would hope that when you're like 30 or 40 or 50, there are some people in your community that you can trust, you know, not only just to have sex with, but to also have an emotional, intimate moment or intellectual moment. In the absence of that, well, what the hell do you have, you know? Uh, Plato is not going to save you in this class, and neither am I. These ideas are trash. They mean nothing. I mean, if you can't apply these ideas, and these ideas can't be applicable, they are tough. Which means that as ideas go, they're good, but they're bumper stickers. So the only thing that you can do is, first of all, be patient. Just be around them, but have friendships where you can go to a coffee shop or, you know, go somewhere, have dinner, and just talk about these ideas over and over and over again. Not only will that enhance the way you think about things, but it'll also create history with you and this other fellow or a community of people. And then in times of crisis, there is someone to call, and this person knows who you are inside and out. Is it true that they could come and hurt you? Absolutely. You're only going to be betrayed by those closest to you, never those who don't know you, you know. Um, And there is another thing you need to know. Whatever it is you want to do, you want to get married, you want to build friendships, you want to get a job, you want to go to school, whatever the case may be, do it when you're young. The moment you get a little up in age, it's going to be tough. You know, because you need time to create relationships with anything. Uh, but you need to be interested. You need to be patient. You need to have the emotional and intellectual stamina. And as you age, you just lose those things. And in as much as you may desire to create friendships, it's difficult. Not because you don't want to. Your body just won't allow you to. You know? And this is a culture where none of those things are given to people. Their parents don't train them. There is no community that trains people in that direction. And so everybody is left to their own devices. And after a while, you know, it's like the prodigal son. The only difference between us and the prodigal son is that there was a father he could go to. We have no one to go back to. There is no culture that supports us, no community, no cult, no parents, nothing. You know. Uh, Michael Douglas played this movie some years ago. It was called um, Something. You know that movie? It was about the market, stock market, Wall Street. And this is like in the second <laughs> part of the movie where he comes at the very beginning of the movie and he says, you guys are Generation X. You have no savings, you have no parents, you have no culture, you have no this, you have no that, you have nothing. 
And you, you desire the best of things in life. And it's great to desire, but if you don't have the resources, none of them are going to come true. You know. <clears throat> All right. Enough of that. So, anyone else? Yeah. Can you talk about um, cannibalism? Cannibalism? Like eating someone? Yeah. Are they still alive or dead? Um, well, in, in this case, dead. In my sociology class, um, we talked about uh, a plane that landed on a mountain. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Why do you take these classes? I don't know. You know, instructors have nothing better to say. They read a couple of stupid pages somewhere and they say, oh, well, this is a good conversation for us. And let's put them in groups, you know, five, and just say one of you is dead. Uh, Who's going to eat this person? And now there's a debate. For half hour, students get together in a group setting and and then, you know, they shoot. Nothing. I'm not really saying much. Long, long, long time ago in India, they believed that when your father dies, when an elder who is known for his or her wisdom dies in your community, you should actually eat their flesh. And there are many, many good reasons for it. You know when someone occupies a physical space, and I'll tell you a story. Um, it, it is related to this uh, wisdom teacher named Gurjeev. He died, um, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago. He was Armenian. His father was very mean to him. Mean in the sense that his father knew he was going to die. And his kid, if he wants to survive life and live his life meaningfully, he can't be a child for too long. He needs to grow up very, very quickly and figure out who he is, what he is, and if there is any wisdom out there on the planet so he can quest after it. So um, that'll give him a relatively meaningful purpose in life. And that's what he did. So when he was like five, his father would wake him up, slap him, and say, run around the block, it's freezing cold, and you got to go butt naked. So his father seasoned him in hardship because he knew that life is tough, and you can't be a sissy. You know, it's something that Betty Davis had said about old age. Old age is not for sissies. If you're a wimp, don't get old because one day you're going to look at your face and it's sprinkles. You're going to look at your head and there's no hair. You're going to look at your back and it's bent, and every part of your body just aches. And yet you have to somehow get yourself to Safeway. You have to find a way to stand in your own kitchen and cook. You know. And so Gurjeev left his parents at a very young age. Um, and he put himself in great hardships as well. He never rested, even though um, in his... I think second, uh, car crash, I mean, every part of his his body was just destroyed. And yet he refused to rest. He said, I need to fix my body. Now, you have a man, you know, you have a physical body, and that physical body has been only in one business. Because of his intellect, and that intellect being conditioned by his geographical location, his father, his mother, where he lived, the forces in that particular culture. So that culture creates inside him emotions. And then his father creates for him a certain way of looking at those emotions and experiencing life. 
So what you have inside this body is this powerhouse. I know how to feel. I know what to do when people judge me. I know what to do when nonsense comes my way. I know what to do with time. I know what to do with my youth. I know what to do with my life. That's a lot of energy inside this physical body of yours. بارقم عشق او را گردون ندارد تحمل چون می تواند کشیدن این پیکر لاغر من that there is this passage in the Quran and this is paraphrased by Hafez the Sufi poet that you know God tries to go to hide in the oceans the oceans are far too feeble far too weak they go dry he goes into the animals to hide himself, but animals break in pieces. He tries every creative thing out there, but no creative thing out there is able to hold, you know, to be a good container for God's presence. And God looks down sadly and says, oh, there is only that two-legged animal there, the human being. Let me try him or her, because it's my last option. And lo and behold, the human being is able to contain the entirety of God. And so that's what Hoffa says. How could a tiny creature like you and I, I mean, you fall victim to the flu. It's a tiny little bug. And then you're bedridden for like two weeks. And yet, despite you being so feeble, so breakable, you have the power, the prowess, the resiliency to withhold the presence of wisdom. You want to call it God, fine. You want to call it Jesus. It doesn't really matter what name you give it. And so what you have is Gurjeev, whom for about 50, 60 years of his life <clears throat> had cults, had student after student after student, and worked them to death. And he knew that nobody is going to be given anything valuable cheaply. You know, so... If someone said, I have a question, you would say, well, hold that question. Why don't you send me an email? And then we'll, you can come to the office. Just to see if the guy or the gal is interested in their own question. Is the question for them intense enough to inspire them to sit behind their laptop, form an email, send an email to make an office appointment, and then come there and sit and talk about their question in a very mature way? You know, uh, and so he died. Now, what happens usually when you have devoted students is that they turn you into a mythical creature. So upon his death, this is what the disciples, the students of decades, wrote down and gave the rest of us, you know, if you were interested to read and then maybe have dim experiences that Upon his death, when he was in his coffin in this church, the lights went out. Thunder began to struck. Birds flew around, began to sing. And then his body just sat in this coffin for about a month and the body never decomposed. So what you have is the body which is the container and what you have inside the body is the content. The emotions, okay. How many years of poisonous or toxic emotions you've had inside you and how well they've been processed or remain unprocessed? How well do you think? Where did you put your body through? Okay. And if you have such a body who has lived such a life, the belief was when you Take a bite of his bicep, for example. You're not, it's just not a pound of meat you're chewing. You also have this person's history, the emotions, the intellect, the experiences that go inside you. But it's an exercise that is rarely done because first no one is able, you know, there is a story about the robe of Jesus. I don't know if you've heard of it. That Jesus dies on the cross, his robe falls to the ground. And no one touches it, uh, except one of the disciples. Foolishly enough, he goes to the robe and he tries to put the robe on his shoulder. And the senior disciple, Peter, says to him, Don't put that robe on you. Oh, it's just uh, you know, a piece of cloth. And he puts the cloth or the robe on his shoulder and uh, his back gets burnt. 
Because what you have is a piece of fabric on the body of Jesus Christ who carried inside him the Spirit of God. That's not a light thing to carry, you know. And so cannibalism in that sense is really good. It's been a practice to this day. There have also been some cases that have gone before the legal courts where you have a homeless man, uh, his best friend, who was also living in a tent next door, passed away. He was really hungry. No one cared for him. And so, and he didn't have the money to bury his friend. I don't know if you've ever buried anyone. These days, it's about a $60,000 deal. You know, uh, a plot of land, depending on where you want this land to be. You know, it goes anywhere from like 7,000 to about 40,000. The coffin, depending on what sort of a coffin you want, do you want it to be composable, decomposable, all that stuff. Uh, Bluetooth, air condition, what kind of fabric, you know, do you want anyone to dance in there while you're dead? Uh, it goes anywhere from 3,000 to about 25,000, 30, 40, 50,000. If you happen to be Donald Trump, it has to be pure gold, so God knows. Um, so not knowing what to do with this corpse, he begins to eat it. And when uh, the judge asks him, you know, this is illegal, he says, you know, there is no one to help me bury this body. I was hungry. No one is there to help me. What's happening to the politicians in the legal system? They see, a, you know, some homeless guy with no food. They, it means nothing to them. What am I supposed to do? And I don't want to see my friend simply rot. So I eat him. Uh, he was given, you know, a 30-day in cell, and then he was let go. Uh, I suppose if you're really hungry, and if you're in the snow, and you're tired of, you know, eating snowballs, just eat someone and pray that they taste good. But so far as... Sociology class, cannibalism. I'm sorry, yes. Why, you're saying that God was trying to find a place to hide. Right. Why would God want to? God is lonely. God is sad. I mean, I, I'm not in the mind of God. I don't know. I'm just telling you the stories I read. Mm -hmm. um, why do people want to hide them?